Um, I tightened it up. If he complains about it, tell him I'm sorry. Um, but some exciting news from Yoder. We are in very preliminary conversations with a doctor about opening a medical clinic at our campus. So a, a doctor from the like, McPherson Salina area um, approached us and said, hey, we realize that there's a, a need in the community of Yoder for a medical clinic. Could we use your facility? And we were like, uh-huh, yeah, that'd be great. Um, so we're in very, very preliminary conversations about that. If you want more details, you can talk to uh, Philip or... Dale Kaufman, um, but there's kind of conversations with the Amish community and, and the local town leadership about what that would do. So um, keep us in prayer as we kind of look at that as an option. So I want to begin this morning by asking a question. Um, when was the last time that you received a letter? And I don't mean like a, like a, a birthday card from your dentist or like a form letter from, from your cell phone company, but like, when, like a, a handwritten ink, like paper stamp letter. When was the last time? Anybody? What? Just, last week. Just last week. Can anybody beat that? Last week. No. Isn't that crazy? Nobody writes letters anymore. Um, well, not nobody. I guess they wrote one last week. But um, I was thinking about the last time I received a letter was when I was in college, which was like a decade ago. And it was still odd then to get a letter. My grandma, every Friday, would sit down and write a letter to all of us grandkids who were in college. And so every Monday or Tuesday, I would receive a, a handwritten letter from my grandma. And like, I, I looked forward to that every week because it was different. It wasn't an email. Um, and so whenever we're looking at at these letters to the seven churches in Revelation, um, letters back then held probably as much, if not more, weight than they do today, because getting a letter somewhere took a long time. We don't know what the postal service was like. When, when Paul wrote these letters to the seven churches, he was actually in exile on an island called Patmos. And, and that would have been a couple hundred miles, and it's on an island, um, from this church in Pergamum. And so we don't know if there was like a guy on a camel with like a bag full of letters like headed to Pergamum, or we're not sure how they got there. But, but what we do know is that this letter carried a lot of weight. Um, soon after he wrote these letters, John was released from exile and, in was able, and, and might have been able to do, hand deliver these letters. We don't know. And it really doesn't matter for the message this morning, but I, I like to let my brain wander about like, how did they actually get there? That's a long distance to walk. Um, the, the interesting thing about John is he was a disciple of Jesus. So he was, he was like direct disciple. He probably shook hands with Jesus, shared meals with Jesus. But when he wrote this letter, he was actually the last living disciple of Jesus that was around at this time. And so to get a letter from someone directly connected to Jesus was a pretty big deal. And not only that, but this, these letters were given to John by Jesus to write down and give out. So these are direct words from Jesus to the churches on how to follow him. All of these letters are, bo are broken into four basic categories. They, they're up here on the, on the whiteboard and they'll be on the screen. And, and the first category is the images of Jesus. What does Jesus want us to know, or want the churches that he's writing to, to know about who he is and what he's about? So there's images of Jesus. There's a section of affirmation. So what is Jesus saying these churches are doing well? That's the affirmation section. And my wife mentioned between services that I left an F out of the word affirmation. So I'm going to fix that. There we go. Okay, so there's the affirmation section. Um, and then there's the, the critique section where, where the, Jesus is telling these churches, like, here's some things you could do better. And then the last section of these letters is the promises section, things that, that will happen, and, and they're not necessarily always good things. And so there's these four sections, and we'll go through them today about the church in Pergamum. If you'll turn with me to Revelation chapter 2, verses 12 to 17... Um, that's where we're going to be this morning. And uh, if you're using the red Bibles, that is on page 1126, 1126, Revelation chapter 2. But I want to start off with a little bit of background information about the city of Pergamum. The city of Pergamum was a notable city. It had an, an interesting skyline. And so I want to show you a picture um, of an interesting skyline, a notable skyline in my life. Does anybody know what skyline this is? Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. That's right. You must be a Steeler fan or a Penguin fan. Oh, you were just there. Awesome. I'm a little jealous. Um, so, so this city is the city of Pittsburgh. And to me, or to anybody that lives in western Pennsylvania, this is a notable skyline. Whenever I think about like driving into the city south um, through the Fort Pitt Tunnel, it's kind of dark. And then you come out on the Fort Pitt, Bri Fort Pitt Bridge, and it, like the whole city just kind of opens up. And there's like Heinz Field over here and PNC Park. And the Three Rivers State Park is down below you, below the, the bridge. And it's just like, oh, 
It's like home. It's like where I grew up. It's my city, I'm, even though I don't live there anymore. It's still like Pittsburgh is a notable city for me and really is a sense of camaraderie to Western Pennsylvania. This is the way the city of Pergamos or Pergamum would have been to the people in that area. They would have known what that city was like. And the reason is because in that city, there was a mound or like a hill in the center of that city. And on top of that hill were some beautiful, beautiful buildings, some really awesome um, architecture. And to the people in, in Pergamum and that region, that would have been a sense of camaraderie. Like, this is our town. This is where we live. But for the church in Pergamum, for the Christians that live there, this was not a sign of camaraderie, but a sign of temptation, a sign of, a, a sign of, of, of like devil worship. Because these buildings were built to other gods. These buildings were these beautiful shrines and worship centers were not built to Jesus or to Yahweh, the one true God. They were built to, um, to other gods. And so it's just a constant reminder, this city, this landscape, it's, it's a constant reminder to the church of like, man, we live in a place that, that is different than us, that worships differently, that believes differently than us. And so um, I want to begin in the beginning of this letter, Revelation chapter 2, verse 12. To the angel of the church in Pergamum, write, these are the words of him who has, who has the sharp, double-edged sword. And this is where we get the first section of our letter, the image of Jesus. It says, to him, Jesus, who has what? What does he have? A double-edged sword. So we see that Jesus has this sword. That's the image of Jesus we're given in this letter to Pergamum. And, and to us, it might not be that big of a deal. Okay, Jesus has the sword, not a big deal. But to the people in Pergamum, this was a pretty politically charged statement because the, the, the Roman government, the government that ruled at that time, gave the, the governors of each state the right of the sword. And the right of the sword meant that the governor got to choose who lived and who died. If I was in Pergamum and I did something wrong, I would have been brought before the governor. They would have told him, okay, this is what Mark did. And there wasn't really a trial. The governor just said, Mark dies or Mark lives. And that was what happened. So the governor had the right of the sword. So by, by Jesus saying, no, 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 like the governor doesn't hold the keys to life. The governor doesn't hold the right of life. Jesus does. It was a pretty bold statement. Uh, and that's how he opens the letter. He wants, a, he wants the church in Pergamum to know that Jesus holds life, okay? So if we continue on in verse 13, he says, I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. So Jesus understands the context. He realizes, like, the government is run by these pagan religions. Like, the, the city council is people that don't worship me. I understand your context. Yet, he says, yet, you remain true to my name. You did not even renounce your faith to me, not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city, this city where Satan lives. And so we're entering into the next part of this letter, this affirmation, is that you, the church of Pergamum is remaining faithful. They're remaining faithful even in the midst of, of a time where there, there are people that follow Jesus who are being killed for following Jesus but yet the church in Pergamum is still following Jesus. So that's a pretty cool affirmation that they're remaining true. They're being faithful to Jesus. And then it says, nevertheless, this is where we're kind of stepping into the critique section of the letter. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so that they ate food sacrificed to idols and committed sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teachings of the Nicolaitans. Repent, therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. So it's saying that some of you are allowing your faith to be compromised. So this is the, the critique that Jesus has to the church in Pergamum, is they are compromising their faith. They're compromising their faith by following the teachings of Balaam and, and the ideas of Balak and the Nicolaitans. Now, I want to be honest with you, there are, is no real historical uh, account of who the Nicolaitans are. Um, there, there's not like a, a history of the Nicolaitans on some shelf somewhere. It doesn't exist. But the church history would tell us that the Nicolaitans are a group of Christians who would have used um, ritual sexuality for worship. So they would, have had, they would have had like temple orgies and prostitution and, and that thing wrapped up in their worship of Jesus. And what, what Jesus is telling the church in Pergamum is that if you're following the teachings of the Nicolaitans, like 
you got to do something different. Okay, so that's the Nicolaitans. Um, and then Balak and, and Balaam are also mentioned. Does anybody re- uh, recognize those two words, Balaam? Does anybody know who Balaam is? What was he famous for? Balaam's donkey. Balaam had a donkey, okay? That's what he's famous for. And what is this donkey famous for? It talks. So there's this talking donkey in the Old Testament in, in Numbers chapter 22 that, um, yeah, so this is the, uh, this, when I think about talking donkeys, I think of Eddie Murphy. Um, but so I want to tell this story real quick because it, uh, uh, Balaam is a prophet in the Old Testament. And so Balaam s- hears from God and speaks truth. And, and what, what was noticed by the people around there is that it, it, he spoke truth. Like when Balaam spoke, those things like were real and, they, and, they, and it was true and it was good. And so there was this, this guy named Balak who was currently the king of Moab. And the king of Moab, Balak, wanted to go to war against the Israelites. And he realized that this prophet, Balaam, when he spoke, like it was real and it was true. And so the king of Moab, Balak, went to Balaam and said, hey, why don't you come over here and, and put a curse on the Israelites so that when we go to war against them, we'll win. And Balaam was like, no, like, no, God is with the Israelites. That's, I'm not going to do that. And so a little while later, Balak, the king of Moab, went to Balaam again and said, hey, listen, here's how it works. I will give you notoriety, I will give you fame, and I will give you money if you come and curse the Israelites so that we can beat them in a war. And Balaam said, hmm, all right, let's talk about that. And so he gets on his donkey, and he heads for Moab, but his donkey won't go. His donkey just stops, and so Balaam beats the donkey, and and the donkey still won't go, and so he beats the donkey a third time, and this is when the donkey turns around and says, what did I ever do to you? And the, like, it actually says in words, like the donkey speaks, and he says, what did I do to you? Um, and the donkey really doesn't have anything to do with today's teaching, but it's an interesting story. Um, but what, what, I, what I think that Jesus is getting at to the church in Pergamum is that Balaam was willing to compromise his faith for something other than God. Okay? And if the people in Pergamum are compromising their faith for something other than God, that's a problem. Um, and, and so whenever he talks about the teachings of Balaam and Balak, um, that's more of what he's talking about. The, the words Balaam and Balak in the New Testament had taken more of a general theme. Okay, So they're names of people in the Old Testament, but they don't necessarily mean those people anymore. I'll give you an example of that today. So the word Google is actually a name. It's a name of a company, right? But if you say, I'm going to go Google something, everybody knows that just really means you're going to go on the internet and look for something. It doesn't matter whether you use Bing or Yahoo or Google, you're just looking for something. So it's more of a verb. That's the way that the words Balak and Balaam would have been understood by the church in Pergamum. The term, uh, the term Balaam was used to refer to false teachers in general. So, so if you're following Balaam, you're just following somebody that claims to teach Jesus but isn't. So false teachers. And the term Balak... Um, means to throw or to cast off without any care of where it goes. It's kind of like throwing your faith to the wind. What, what Jesus is saying to the church in Pergamum by using this term Balak is that they're kind of taking their spirituality and just kind of seeing what happens. They're saying like, well, this sounds good. Let's try that out. Or like, this idea is intriguing. So let's go over there and, and dabble in that for a while. And what Jesus is saying is no, like, no, you need to you need to turn around. You need, you need to repent is what it says. And to turn around, that's what repent means. It's a direct translation meaning turn around. You need to turn around and realign yourself with Jesus. You're letting yourselves be compromised or adulterated by what feels right instead of following what is, ac- following what is actually the best thing for you. You're letting the thrill of mysticism and personal enlightenment coax you into idol worship. And you're doing whatever feels right sexually and calling it worship. And Jesus says, that has to stop. That has to stop or else I will what? And this is where we get into the promises. What does Jesus say? You need to stop or else I will. What does it say in in that verse 16? I will fight against you with the sword of my mouth. So I will fight against you or fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Now, what is this, this sword of my mouth? What does that mean? Anybody have a guess? 
words. Yes. So Jesus is saying, you need to turn around from what you're doing, realign yourself with me, with Jesus, or else I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth, with words. I'm going to speak badly against you. Now, some people might say like, okay, big deal. Somebody, like people talk bad about me all the time. However, if you, if you realize who's saying these things, Jesus is the same guy that way, way, way back when caused the universe to like just begin only by speaking. That he set the universe in motion with the words of his mouth. And so if Jesus decides to speak against me with those same words, it's kind of a big deal. And so Jesus is promising, like, if you don't change what you're doing and realign yourself with me, it's going to be bad. So then we get to the closing of this letter. And it also has some promises in it, but I'll read it. Uh, It's verse 17. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. So it says, if you have ears, listen up. So essentially, everyone in the church in Pergamum, pay attention, because I assume they all had ears. I don't know that for sure. But um, as far as I know, human anatomy is pretty much the same as it used to be. Um, So if you have ears, pay attention, okay? Because... Those of you who are successful in turning around and realigning yourself with Jesus will get two things. There's a promise of two things. One is hidden manna, and the second one is a white stone with a new name on it. Now, this word manna, what is it? What is manna? It's also in the Bible in the Old Testament. What is manna? Food? It's some kind of food? What do we know about manna? It's different, right? What do we know about it? It comes from heaven? What else? Sorry, I didn't... It has a short shelf life. Is that what you said? Okay, so yes, so manna is this like, it's this food that when the Israelites were in the desert, they were were starving and they said to God, God, we're going to starve. Like, we need help. And so what did he do? He sent this manna. And actually the Hebrew translation is manha. It's two words, M-A-N-N-H-U, manha. And basically the direct translation means, what is it? And so I can imagine like the Israelites praying to God for food. They come out and they find this bread on the ground and they pick it up and they're like, what is it? And they're like, I don't know. So let's just call it, what is it? And so that's what they did. And so it's called, what is it? Manha actually means, what is it? So it's this, it's this food that comes from heaven that like, we don't know where it comes from. And if you don't pick it up soon enough, then it's gone. Like it, it dries up and disappears. But, and, and if you collect enough of it, you can eat it. But if you collect too much, it gets moldy. But on Saturdays, you can collect twice as much because then you can eat on Sunday. What is it? Right? And so what Jesus is, is saying here is that if you, if you turn around and realign yourself with Jesus, I will give you divine sustenance. Those are big words, divine sustenance. I will give you a fulfillment that you don't understand that comes from God. If you're willing to, to realize what's going on, to turn around and align, realign yourself with Jesus, I will give you this fulfillment you're looking for, this divine sustenance. The second promise in this closing is that, is that he will give us a white, or he will give them, a white stone with a new name on it, known only to the one who has it. Now, the, the literal Greek translation means this. White means purified, stone means wisdom, and new name in this context means the name of Jesus. So if, if, if the people in Pergamum that are willing to realign themselves with Jesus are successful, they will have wisdom they will become purified, and they will become one with our Creator. That's a pretty cool promise that, that, that Jesus gives them if they're willing to turn around and change what they're doing. So what about us? What about us here at Journey Mennonite Church? What can we learn from this church in Pergamum? Now, I use the words mysticism and sex worship. And so I asked the question, like, do I, do I, do we deal with mysticism and sex worship at Journey Mennonite Church? And I would say, yes, I think so. There's, there's like countless self-help books out there and these, these ideas of, like, of, of enlightenment and you can better yourself if you, or, or if you meditate in this way, you'll feel this, this freedom that is awesome. And that's mysticism. I mean, it, it's, it's guised in this betterment of yourself and others, but it really is mysticism. Here's the thing. Some of it is very good. Some self-help books are awesome 
and true and real. But what I think that we can learn from this letter is that if we see this awesome idea, and I, I personally deal with this, is that I see an awesome way of living, and I'm like, yeah, let's check it out. But what I think we're learning here is that we take that idea, we bring it to Jesus, and we see if it lines up. If that new idea lines up with Jesus, who's our foundation of everything we do, awesome, chase it, go after it, do that thing. But if it doesn't line up with Jesus, you need to take it seriously and walk away. I think that's what we can learn. Is that if somebody promises something better, does it line up with Jesus? And I also think that, yes, some of us, some of us deal with sex worship. That, that we, we dabble sexually and call it pure because it feels right. When in reality, we're giving something away that is actually meant for worship to God. What it's really about is our source of fulfillment. Am I looking for fulfillment in the next self-help book or, or meditation practice? Or am I looking towards Jesus? Is that where I get my fulfillment? Am I looking for my fulfillment in my sexuality? Am I looking to a computer screen for fulfillment? Am I, am I um, having inappropriate expectations of my, my spouse for fulfillment? Or do I have too much emotional connection with a coworker? Is that where I get my fulfillment? What Jesus is saying, if we're not looking towards the creator of the universe for our fulfillment, we're in the wrong place. What Jesus is saying for this particular church in Pergamum is that there are some people finding fulfillment in se sexuality and mysticism, but really, we need to be looking towards Jesus. Those are pretty strong words, but I believe they were true then and they're true now. Is our fulfillment in Jesus? That's the basic question for this morning. And even bigger than this morning, we are, we are doing uh, this series on the seven letters to the churches in Revelation, but we have eight weeks lined out for it. So how does that work? Seven letters, eight weeks. Well, week number eight is going to be the eighth letter, and we, we're going to read or talk about uh, the eighth letter to the angel of the church at Journey. And so what I want you to, to do is, if you don't have one of these already, we, we passed them out a couple weeks ago. This is a, a feedback form. There's some out there, I can't remember what you guys call it at this campus, but the table by the kitchen. Um, there's, there's some of these out there, so if you don't have one, grab one. And what I would encourage you to do is, is as you're listening to what God has for us, as you're praying and, and doing your devotions, um, ask God, what are, the, what are the images of you, Jesus, that we need to know? What are the, the affirmations of journey that you want us to know about? What are we doing well? What are the criticisms that you have for Journey that maybe we should tweak and do a little differently? And what are the promises that you have for us in our community? And, and as you hear them, write them down, and, and we'll ask you to turn them in here in a couple weeks um, so that we can, we can listen to the Holy Spirit and say, like, God, what do you want us to learn? I'm going to close in prayer, and then the uh, worship team will come on up and, uh, and close our time this morning. God, we thank you for... We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your promises. And God, I, I, I pray that we would be able to realign ourselves with you, find our fulfillment in you, God. Amen. Well, I would invite you guys to stand as we praise this awesome God that we serve. And we're going to kick it up a notch, and we're going to really celebrate this morning. Oh